Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this Thanksgiving Day is based on David's words in the 34th Psalm. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. You will see that as you lose taste for the things of this world, the Lord is eager to fill your heart with delight in his word. To that end we pray, Lord Jesus, bless thy word, that we may trust in thee. Amen. Thanksgiving is a day for traditional recipes. There will undoubtedly be a turkey somewhere on your table, a smattering of the usual side dishes. Each of your households has as well their own unique traditions, the same dishes and flavors year after year. With time, these traditions become so ingrained in the mind there's a tendency to expect your thanksgiving to taste a certain way. But this demand can be trickier to meet than you think, if not impossible. There's one holiday dish from my youth I've never been able to replicate my grandmother's scalloped potatoes. I used to watch her make it in anticipation. I remember the process, and my mother has repeated to me every detail of what her mother did, but neither of us can make it taste the same as she did. I've come to realize I'm not alone in this struggle. No, I'm sure most of you can think back to something you loved eating as a child, perhaps a dish prepared by a now-departed mother or grandmother of yours, that no one else seems to be able to make the same way. It might turn out looking like what you used to make, but one bite, and you know something's not quite right. You cooks, you, you might have a handwritten recipe of this treasure from the past. Follow every measurement and step in precise detail, trying to impress, only to be rewarded with the compliment, it's good, but not like she used to make. There's a real and perhaps surprising reason why. Of course, there's the sentiment for that departed loved one no longer with you. The eating experience will never be the same as when she made it herself and watched you gobble it all up as quickly as you could with an approving smile. But there's another, almost scientific reason. It doesn't taste the same as when you were a child. Because as you grow older, you have less taste buds than you used to. When your taste buds are damaged or die in your younger years, they grow back right away. But with age, they stop coming back. So when you've been told something you've cooked doesn't taste the way a mother or a grandmother used to make it, it's no criticism of your culinary skills, and they're not making it up. Their sense of taste is going away, which is an unavoidable consequence of sin called death.
You all have loved ones who used to care for you in their own special way, a way no other person could fully replace. Traditions and little secrets only they knew, never written down, now lost. And even if you could get every detail precise and follow it step by step, it still wouldn't taste nearly as good as you remember because your sense of taste, as do all your senses, fades and dies. which is part of the slow path we all take to the grave. No, that exact taste of the past, you won't have it again. It can't come back. But God does offer a replacement, a sense of taste not quite like that elusive one you remember. No, a far greater joy with which nothing else can compare. Dear Christians, God only allows you to feel such disappointments, mild or not, even at Thanksgiving dinner, as part of his plan for you to mature in faith, that we would lose our fascination with the things of this world and come to savor more and more the unchanging glory of his word. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Yes, Thanksgiving is a day for traditional recipes. On account of sin, though, we can never have it quite as good as we remember with time all things of this world pass and fade, even our ability to enjoy them. But when it comes to the pure doctrine of God's holy word, there's no need to try to recreate the past or long for how it used to be. The holy scriptures are the only immutable truth in a fallen world full of so much change. The Bible diagnoses the real problem behind every disappointment in life and provides the answer. For the word of God replaces our distaste in this earthly life with the sure and certain hope of an eternal one. When this word of life was made flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus, your Savior, he did not shy away from the dinner table. There was no Thanksgiving day quite like ours, no turkey undressing, but the Son of God was often involved in feasting and drinking. We often mark special occasions with a feast, and Jesus approved of such with his first miracle, turning water into wine at a wedding celebration, thereby revealing his desire to replace your every disappointment with joy by the power of his word. When preaching good news at length, he repeatedly took the time to feed his famished audience by miraculously filling their bellies with a meager offering of a few loaves and fishes. And as they ate, he smiled approvingly as he watched them gobble it up, because it taught them and us 
to trust in him and his word to provide all things. The Lord Jesus ate and drank at every opportunity, it would seem, so much so that he was accused of indulging in the things of this world, as if his celebrating with food so often meant he didn't take sin and repentance seriously enough. His accusers clearly did not understand what he came to do. No one took sin as seriously as the one who came to redeem you from eternal hell. He refuted their accusations and defended his Thanksgiving dinners with the words, Can the children of the bride, bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The Pharisees, and even some of John's former and confused disciples, thought fasting and self-denial were the answer to sin. No, Jesus was. And his presence, the Son of God, come to save a world of sinners, he was and is real reason to feast and celebrate. Such thanksgivings did not mean he didn't take sin seriously. No, they celebrated his power and authority to conquer it. An astounding miracle and feat, he said, they were about to watch unfold. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. That time would soon be upon them. Not so much a fast from food. Eating was the farthest thing from their minds, the few brief hours between his arrest and his tomb. It'll happen so quickly. The fasting he meant was the sorrow which came from watching what their master would endure in our place. There was neither feasting nor celebrating for the Son of God on Good Friday. The only flavor in Jesus' mouth was his own sweat, mingled with blood. A cup of suffering so bitter, he said, none of us would want to taste it. But he did. So you would never have to. His time of fasting was what he gave up for you. For on the cross Jesus exchanged his Father's perfect love for the rightful wrath each of our sins deserves. paying the price of your salvation, full and complete, such that on the third day, when he rose again from the dead, to announce the forgiveness of all of your sins, he instituted a celebration, which we continue today, the preaching of this gospel. A victory feast of thanksgiving and proclamation, which by his grace we will continue unto life eternal. This is your great hope when life disappoints, when any worldly hope is dashed, the loss of a loved one's voice you'll never hear round your table again when things just never seem to taste like they used to, Jesus lives. And now is death but the gate of life immortal. This shall calm my trembling breath when I pass its gloomy portal, that faith shall cry, as fails each sense, Jesus, he is 
my confidence. For as every sense fades, fades and dies, as all things come to disappoint, this gospel fills the void in your heart with faith, and from faith, delight in his holy word, the forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, in Jesus' name. Oh, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. Yes, as you grow older, Thanksgiving isn't what it once was. The food doesn't taste the same. You're not able to eat what you once could. And if you can somehow manage to, it'll make you sick. But there's still a way to enjoy it. Instead of trying to live up the thanksgivings of your past, my advice is to embrace the present and enjoy it vicariously through those who still can and in a way that by faith you may behold a wondrous display of the word of God at work for each of you will be graced to have round your table today several guests who can eat like you used to and who will enjoy it like you remember. Your children and grandchildren. Their taste buds have not started dying like ours. They also have yet to suffer the greater disappointments and losses we have. So let them eat and drink today. Their time of fasting will come. The scriptures say children are a blessing, like olive plants round about thy table. And the particular blessing to be enjoyed as you watch your children and grandchildren eat with you this afternoon is that they sat with you here gathered around the feast of God's word this morning. So watch them gobble up your food with great delight. For by faith, you're privileged to watch God raise up the next generation of this congregation right before your eyes. Your heritage in the Lord, the ones who by God's grace, will continue this gospel proclamation after you are gone. Faithful to everything you taught them, everything the scriptures have to teach and say. So young ones, when grandma tells you, keep eating, Remember, she means not just from her kitchen, but from this pulpit. And see in your grandfather's approving smile a prayer of thanksgiving to his God that you are here today, and that by the Spirit's grace and power, you will be for many years to come. Happy Thanksgiving.